This is Professor Henkian Honing. I'm an author of The Evolving Animal Orchestra and editor of the book The Origins of Musicality. And I'm very happy to be at Musicality Now. Hi, my name is Christopher. I'm the founder and director of Musical U, and welcome to Musicality Now. Today I'm joined by Professor Henkian Honing, one of the leading researchers in the field of music cognition, and more recently, biomusicology. He's the author of The Evolving Animal Orchestra, a fascinating book looking at what we can learn about musicality from the animal kingdom, and The Origins of Musicality, a detailed guide to the latest cutting-edge research on where human musicality comes from and how it works. I've been informally following the research in this field for a while, especially around the topic of amusia or tone deafness, but diving into Professor Honing's work was the first time I really got a sense of how much the animal research can reveal about human musicality, and it is both exciting and fascinating. In this conversation, we talk about the crucial research study with newborn infants which changed the whole trajectory of Professor Honing's research. We talk about the two surprising facts about absolute pitch, often called perfect pitch, which might completely change how you think about this seemingly magical skill. And we talk about what the state-of-the-art scientific research tells us about how much musicality is an innate part of us versus a purely learned skill. We cover a lot of ground in this conversation, and given the nature of scientific research, there are at least as many interesting open questions there as there are answers, but I know you're going to come away from it with some new insights that can inform your own musicality training, as well as a newfound curiosity about this fascinating area of research that is clearly still at a really exciting and relatively early stage. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is Musicality Now from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Professor Honing. Thank you for joining us today. Nice, thanks. Nice to be here. <laughs> so as I said to you a moment ago before we hit record, I have been so looking forward to this one because I've been thoroughly devouring your two most recent books, The Evolving Animal Orchestra and The Origins mm -hmm. of Musicality, which you co-authored with a number of other academic researchers. And you really specialize in the scientific view on musicality. Obviously, that's something we talk about a lot on this show, and we've had various people weigh mm -hmm. in as to what is musicality. And I'd love if we could begin our conversation by just asking you that very question. To you, what is musicality? Uh, yeah, musicality is, oh, we think it is a very complex thing in the sense that it is not one thing, but it is multiple uh, skills that we still don't know precisely what they are, but <laughs> uh, we are we agreeing, or in the, at least in the definition, we agree that musicality is something that is naturally so biologically based, spontaneously developing, you don't have to do a thing, you will just uh, uh, get better and better at it. Uh, that is based on and constrained by our cognitive system and by our biological system. So it is a sort of, just like language, an innate capacity for music that we all have. And that's the term musicality. We use that for that particular, uh, yeah, for the capacity of music. So not so much the, the, the use of the word like a special musical talent or somebody somebody's very musical in the sense that he, he or she plays very nicely or, or, or special, but more like a very, yeah, actually quite the opposite, uh, that it is a common talent. It's a shared, widely shared human uh, talent. And one of the most striking experiments from your research is with newborn infants, giving an indication that actually this truly is something innate to us. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, that was for me an important study because that is, I think it's now almost 10 years ago um, where, where I was interested and still am I, mostly interested in rhythm as a sort of a fundamental aspect of, mu of musicality or of music cognition. Uh, and, how, uh, and we did an experiment with newborn babies uh, uh, presenting them rhythms where once in a while we removed a note. This was a uh, sort of kind of an experimental setup where we wanted to see do newborn babies already have beat perception? Do they pick up the regularity in the music? And we were interested in that because there was a discussion at that time that maybe that these videos that you see have young children dancing or sort of moving almost automatically to music, uh, whether that is learned, whether that is because the parents sort of uh, say, yes, do it again, or we film it or enthusiastically reacting, or is it a natural inborn talent 
And uh, to answer that question, we did this experiment, listening experiment with newborn babies, two, uh, three days old, removing notes on the downbeat, where you have a high expectation something will happen. So if you remove a note there, it sounds very, uh, yeah, it's a syncope. Uh, uh, it starts, starts the, the rhythm stumbles. It's a very loud nothing. You have a high expectation something will happen. It does not happen. Nothing. <laughs> if you do it in another position in in uh, in the rhythm and music theory says it's not a syncopation you, you you don't notice it that that much so the hypothesis is that if you have beat perception if you pick up your regularity from the rhythm you should note the downbeat removal of the downbeat more strongly than somewhere else in the rhythm and uh, if you do that uh, listening experiment with grown-ups we see that all over, over again that they, they indeed have this sort of uh, high expectation for the downbeat and they are more surprised if you remove something there than in another place of the rhythm. But we also found, and that was the big outcome of this paper in 2009, that um, newborn babies have the same thing. So you also see that their brains are surprised if you remove a note on the downbeat. So this is evidence for the fact that they, babies have beat perception, that it is well, at least very early active. We still don't know whether there's some learning because the, the auditory system is already functioning for three months in the last trimester of the, of the pregnancy. So we can't really disentangle these two, but it is active very early on and you wonder why. <laughs> because beat perception, it's it's in a way, uh, yeah, it's useless for language because there you want to avoid vecularity. Uh, one hypothesis that it has to do with heart beat and we could, yeah, there's lots to tell about that, but that turned out to be also not very likely. But it is fundamental to music. I mean, if you want to make music together with somebody else, you have to be able to synchronize. You have to be able to make uh, to hear the tempo of the other person. If you want to dance together, you also have to pick up this regularity. So it is a fundamental skill. Without music and dance, it wouldn't be able to exist. And that made me very exciting 10 years ago. <laughs> Uh, I didn't expect it for one thing, and and then and then I thought, okay, so maybe music has more a more biological basic basis than I thought before. And since then, I, I I started to look for collaborators in neurobiology and behavioral biology to see, like, if there is a neural, a neural or a biological basis, what is it, and why do we have music, and is it something unique for us, or do we share it with other animals? Because if it's a biological basis, you would expect we share it at least with some. Other animals. So that's, yeah, that was an important uh, paper in 2009 for me because it, it changed it changed my life basically, and I I switched my toolkit kit in research research again from psychology to biology, and and that's still going on. Uh, yeah. Terrific. Well, one thing I really liked about the Evolving Animal Orchestra was you wrote the book as a, a story more than kind of a research summary and you told a bit of this journey. I wonder if we could just fill in a little bit of the backstory before that pivotal study. What had you been researching? What was your background? Um, well, I, I started really as a musician. So so, so that was my first... Uh, uh, I played the piano um, uh, until I was, I think, 22 or something and, and very... Uh, I mean, I didn't do much else. We're all musicians. The whole family, they're all professional musicians. So I was obviously, I should be a pianist as well. Uh, but I got fascinated by computers in the 80s when there were also the first synthesizers. And, and I thought it was very cool. Even so cool that I thought a piano was old fashioned. <laughs> so I, I sold all my old instruments and I really got obsessed by this computer. And that was my first field of research. So I was interested in what? Can a computer do for music? And the most thing that I found the most uh, interesting question was, can you have a computer that listens in a way that humans listen to music? So I was fascinated by the idea to make a listening machine. <laughs> like, like for instance, a drum machine that can follow you and then plays faster if you play faster or that sort of goes against your beat. If you... That was an idea that I thought, oh, fascinating. And then I found out, and that's how I got into science, relatively late actually, that I, with all my knowledge as a musician, I couldn't explain the computer what tempo is, or what early or late is in terms of a rhythm, or what is groove. I couldn't, I mean, I, I can recognize it, I can, I can play it, <laughs> but I couldn't put it into numbers. 
um, that I found so, in a way, shocking that I thought, well, I have to, yeah, I have to figure that out because we must, it must, we must be able to do that because our minds can do that. Uh, and so I was very much a believer that that uh, that that was possible, and it turned out to be a new field. That was sort of the cognitive science of mu of music or computational musicology, uh, a whole new era where people uh, started to make models of uh, our musical listening. Not so much, maybe that's good to add as well. Not so much to to, to replicate a human or to sort of or, or to make something that is better than a human, but really to understand how a human works. So it's a tool to understand something about our own uh, uh, listening skills, and that is basically still. What the field is about music cognition it's just we really try to understand what we humans can do so easily yeah? we can so easily hear what the beat is of the music we can clap along no problem whatsoever still it is a challenge for a computer to do the same thing if you play a little bit of reggae for instance to one of these novel drum machines they have no idea where you are <laughs> because the downbeat is missing uh, so this, this is intriguing to see that, that there are things that we can do very easily. Uh, and I find those the most interesting ones, the things that are seemingly trivial to, to us, to, to musicians, but also to musicologists. I mean, I, I basically study beat perception and relative pitch, two things that musicologists think, well, that's too boring to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to study. But they're so fascinating because they're also very difficult to find uh, in the animal world. It seems to be really a human uh, talent. And it is fundamental to our listening pressure. Without relative pitch, you can't listen to theme and variations because you wouldn't re recognize that it is a variation of that theme. And without beat perception, you wouldn't be able that it speeds up or slows down or, or, or yeah. So. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, I, it, it, 100%, yeah. I, I think there was literally a sentence in the conclusion of my undergrad dissertation that said it was about um, automatic transcription of tunes played on the harmonica and trying to recognize the tune. And I said something like, this was cool, but it's kind of incredible that computers can't do this when it's so easy to a human. And in my masters, I was looking at vocal music in pop recordings and trying to do that same kind of automatic transcription. And it was just, it was mind boggling how rich the data was that we were trying to pick apart with the computer, given how simple it sounds to the human ear. And what I didn't have a clue about at the time was what is now called biomusicology and this field that you've gone on to really pioneer and study. And mm -hmm. I, I would love that we could share some of that with the audience because it's sheds such a fascinating different light you know having looked at how humans do it and how computers do it to then look at how the animal kingdom can reveal other aspects of what's going on um i'd love if we could talk a little bit about that yeah yeah because that's indeed the the the, the, the strategy of the book is to just like i previously was used a machine to understand something about our mind musical mind uh since 2009 i uh, I'm interested in other animals to see how the human does again uh, do, do this musical listening. So it's, it, I'm interested in, in, in humans in that sense, but I use methods from biology to understand more about how we are and what we, and what we do. And in the evolution, the evolving animal orchestra, uh, I really sh I started making notes on day one. So when the baby research was, was finished and I got excited, I, started, I made diary notes. And it's all in a sort of in a montage in the book of like, how, how do I find another behavioral biologist that's interested to do the same experiment with newborns, for instance, with monkeys? Simple question, problematic story. <laughs> and uh, maybe before and, and we go into that, yeah, yeah, maybe I could just um, ask, why would you want to do that? Is it a matter of looking at uh -huh. the physical biology because it's simpler than the human? Or, you know, there's this other aspect of the evolutional way of comparing the species, yeah. looking at a species that is similar in e evolutionary terms and one that's different. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, there are multiple reasons to do comparative research, but uh, the, the reason why I wa wanted to look at other animals was to see, like, is this, again, to see how strong the evidence is for a biological basis for music so and how much is it in our in our genes in that sense uh, or a result of how humans evolved so that is both the evolutionary question and the biological question combined because uh, you could also say music is uniquely human 
uh, and you can say the same thing for language. But also with language, we know now that at least some of the components of language we share with other animals. Other animals also can have some communicative talent. And, and that gives us an enormous rich information about how to understand our own language. And I want to do the same thing uh, looking at those researches. I'm a bit jealous of language research because there are many, many people and we're just a few. Uh, but it has, I think, the same potential, this capacity for music has cultural components, social components, but clearly also uh, pointing at some biological basis. And, and this is one strategy to figure out the, the biological basis by doing comparative research, com looking at a particular musical skill, look at that same musical skill in animals that are genetically very close, because then according to yeah, sort of neo-Darwinian neo assumption that two animals that have the same solution to the same problem that are genetically very close, uh, their common ancestor probably also had that particular skill. So you can, in the here and now, say something about the musical skill and when it arose in the past. Also, with animals that are genetically very distant from us, they might also have evolved that particular skill. And then you have multiple, then they don't have a shared common ancestor uh, that had that skill, probably, and that it evolved independently. And then you have two data points. And then you can do all kinds of nice techniques of sort of figuring out why did beat perception evolve in the evolution of humans or even of primates? Um, why do birds, some birds, and not all birds, have it as well? Uh, and, and that gives you a, a very rich story which, uh, about which has been speculated for ages already. There are lots of theories why we have music. Uh, uh, because we imitate birds or because we are uh, because of parents uh, child bonding there are multiple theories sexual selection is the third one by darwin all these theories can be true but we don't know how to test them and with this new methodology comparative uh, biology basically you can sort of start answering which theory is more likely and which theory is less likely and that's what scientists love uh, <laughs> in the end we want to know what is more likely the truth than something else that can't be all true uh, so so that is yeah this this perspective on on the possibilities that we if we uh, uh, understand uh, better the biological basis of our talent for music then we can do all answer all these questions that have been standing out for ages and that's very exciting and that's why more and more people luckily uh, come in the field and start helping and doing all these experiments and so and and the book describes that and and also the book describes that in a way in a very honest way because i mean in research normally you only see in the end wonderful results babies can hear the beat but here you also see the path towards that so i really wanted to show the process with all the failures because i mean i mean 80 percent of the time things go wrong because of stupid mistakes because of naive optimism because of uh, all kinds of these things. So I, I'm, I'm quite honest in this book. I want it to be. <laughs> uh, because so in the end, it is also still like, yeah, uh, what do we know now? Yeah, not very much yet. Not very much yet. But you see, like, how can you figure, how can you answer those questions? We know now that it's possible to answer those questions because the methodology is more clear. Uh, but still, the, yeah, almost every month there is a paper that again sort of shakes uh, the theories that are there. And it's, yeah, it's exciting. It's an exciting time for me. That's definitely the impression I came away with yeah. from both books. Like it, this is a, a burgeoning field with a lot of really exciting questions still to be answered. And I think there was a, a comment in, in one of them along the lines of, you know, it's really an underserved area of research because in some sense society still considers music to be uh, a nice to have you know an optional perk rather than something really fundamental and intrinsic and yeah. um, as you say you know a lot more attention may be paid to language in this kind of research than has yeah. been to music which the, the upside is there are still fascinating questions to find out the answers to so you did find a collaborator to take that newborn experiment to the animal kingdom and traveled to Mexico. Could you tell us a little bit about how that went and what it revealed? Yeah, this was, yeah, most of these things happen by coincidence. So I was sitting at a, at a table at a conference uh, uh, next to someone that I didn't know, uh, Hugo Merchant. Uh, and he is uh, uh, an expert in the, in the auditory system. Uh, he does biomedical research. So he, he, he contributes to the whole literature that we know about uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, 
deafness. Uh, so a very different type of researcher. But uh, I said, well, I have this simple experiment. Uh, nobody wants to do this. And he understands why primate researchers didn't want to do that because of all kinds of ethical reasons, but also because of uh, competition with the techniques that they normally use, which is invasive techniques. Right? They normally they like to go with electrodes in the brains because we're allowed to do that apparently with rhesus macaques and then measure uh, whether there is beat perception or not. I, I didn't want to do that because I thought for my questions that was one step too far. I wanted just to do, use this and this non-invasive technique, just a few electrodes on the skull. We did it with newborns as well, that it's, that's not chromatic at all. And you can still see whether they are sensitive to the beat or not. And he said, okay, let's do it. And he, he really arranged this whole lab. He bought new equipment. So I was very honored. And uh, we worked for a year. And then uh, the result was basically that rhesus macaques cannot do it. They're an animal model for our brains. Eh? Their, their brains look so similar to ours. And that's why we use those animals for experiments that we don't want to do on humans, but apparently we, we allow ourselves to do on other uh, monkeys. Uh, and that, so they help the literature a lot uh, in, in that sense, the medical literature, but, uh, but they don't have beat perception. So we came up with a new theory that it is probably not the particular structures like the motor cortex or the auditory cortex, but the connections between those areas that makes the difference. And that's an hypothesis we've, we've, we've worked on since then to see like, okay, maybe, because this is disappointing. Eh? So again, it suggests that, that music is uniquely human. It's not shared with rhesus macaques, at least this particular skill, beat perception. And I, I, I don't believe that, I think, if it is, has a biological basis, it should have a longer, a longer history. Um, so the hypothesis now was that uh, it is sort of evolved gradually within the primates. So rhesus macaques do not have it, or at least barely, but then probably chimpanzees have it a little bit more, and humans have it like fully fledged, like we all have, like young children start to move to the music almost automatically, because these connections between the motor cortex and the auditory cortex, they're both directions they're they're very strong so they they have to move when they hear the music um, but that evolved slowly so that probably that sympathy should have that a little bit and uh and that was also this also described in the book that i went to a chimpanzee lab to see like we do the experiment there and there we couldn't do that because we we're not allowed to stick electrodes on the head of the chimpanzee so we had to do it in another way and that paper actually came out Yet we're now in January 2020. It came out two weeks ago. <laughs> so indeed, as predicted, chimpanzees have, uh, well, at least they spontaneously start to move when they hear regular music, just like young children do. So luckily, <laughs> in a way, I am not allowed to say that as a scientist, but at least the, the weird idea that it is uniquely human is, is already, uh, is now falsified. Uh, and that and that gives me more uh, sort of confidence that this biological basis is a, is a proper route to go to. Uh, there are also other animals, maybe we come to that, that can also do it, but they are far, for, genetically further away from this. This is what sort of, uh, yeah, really the question like within primates, do we share some musical skills? Yeah. And it's so interesting how it can you know, not just answer that big question, but shed so much light on what must be going on under the hood, as it were. There was another case, and forgive me if I'm oversimplifying, but you were looking at a, a pair of individual humans with beat deafness, which is incredibly right. rare. And yeah. what you found in the course of the experiments was that it wasn't that they were completely oblivious to the beat. There was something in their brain that was picking up on what you would expect to see. But then there was some kind of network in the brain that hadn't been built out to actually give them the conscious awareness of what was yeah. going on. Yeah, it's very interesting because, I mean, uh, with beat perception, it seems like everyone has it. Uh, musicians, non-musicians, everybody has this sensitivity. So it's very easy for us. Also, of course, you have some variability. You have people that are better at picking up the beat and less uh, well. And that's also for us very interesting because we need this variability to do our statistics. <laughs> uh, but also an interesting thing is to look for people that have apparently do not have beat perception. And that's, we know of people who are tone deaf or amusia is the more general term. So they're really amusical. They don't have music. 
uh, and tone deafness, so not be able to distinguish two melodies as being different, is a very, yeah, it's a, it's a skill. I think it is now the estimates are one and a half percent of the world population that have that. So it's, it's a pretty large group, in more or less uh, uh, le levels of, of, of uh, sensibility for that. And beat perception is far more difficult. So to find someone who really does not pick up the beat. So somebody who cannot hear the difference between a march and a waltz. Uh, together with Isabella Peretz in the, in the Brahms Institute, uh, we've now found, I think, six people of hundreds of people that they, they scan uh, over the years. Uh, so it is a very, yeah, that's very uncommon. Uh, and such a person I described in the book, it's, it's Mathieu and also Marjorie. Uh, uh, we did the same experiment that we did with the newborn, so with the macaques, five electrodes or maybe a little bit more uh, on the skull listening to drum rhythms, removing notes in different positions of the rhythm. And then you see, you already explained in the introduction, you see that their brains recognize when, when there is an omission on the downbeat, so they do have beat perception, but uh, some other measure, uh, uh, another event-related potential shows that they have no conscious access to it. So their brains still have beat perception. It's just, yeah, we think it is a, a feed, feedback loop that is sort of lacking or less developed, but that doesn't allow them to get access to that information of like, there's the downbeat. And you see the same thing with people with tone deafness. So that's the more, the common explanation of how people are uh, sort of have uh, amusia, that it is uh, yeah, a malfunctioning of this, this uh, uh, feedback loop. And that's very, it's very interesting. So even even somebody who has who is beat deaf still can pick up the beat technically, <laughs> or uh, uh, literally the brain. So yeah, that's that's an interesting um, that's interesting for multiple reasons. Also, I, I talked too much uh, then in those days uh, uh, a few times, and he had to laugh, of course, because yeah, he has no beat perception, and I'm spending most of my life. <laughs> He says, I, I don't miss a thing. <laughs> and uh, so, so we had uh, yeah, quite some fun about it. Because, but then also there's some video footage where he explains that, yeah, well, uh, in part these people said, well, please uh, don't play that guitar because that doesn't sound good. Or uh, if, if we don't, let me lead because you don't know where to go. So there were some social implications, uh, minor social implications that he found problematic. But for the rest, he's very, he has normal, normal intelligence. He, is, uh, um, he speaks multiple languages. He even has a, a talk show. He's a DJ. Uh, so that was, it's fascinating to see that there is apparently something wrong there in the network of the brain uh, that uh, uh, let him uh, not pick up this regularity. And that's very, very interesting for, for our research to see, like, can you repair that? Or uh, why is, it, is such the talent so stubborn or so uh, omnipresent? Mm. I love that a moment ago you referred to the group with amusia or tone deafness at 1.5% as being a large group. <laughs> and of course it is compared to beat deafness, but it's all about perspective. We went on this big project a few years back trying to convey to people how rare tone deafness is because so many people who can't sing declare themselves tone deaf and completely incapable when in fact they just haven't learned to train their voice. And actually we were drawing on Isabella Perez's work to develop our tone deafness test online and it, it validates that, you know, it's one to two percent of individuals who truly can't do it. And for us, that was a, a reason to go out and shout about how rare it is. <laughs> but of course, yeah. beat deafness even more so and it's yeah. so fascinating to look at what's going on biologically yeah. and what we can learn from that. I think one of the most interesting parts of your books for me was that you're kind of, as a research field, you were trying to construct mm -hmm. this model of how humans process and understand music. And that is so often done kind of top down, you know, a musicologist or someone like myself, a music educator will think about, here's the music, how can we break it down? Well, we've got melody, we've got harmony, we've got rhythm, we've got timbre, and try and work down to what's the simplest thing we could teach to people. And mm -hmm. your, you and your contemporaries are kind of doing it from the bottom up and saying, what are the most fundamental things that we can biologically see are happening? And yeah. what can we 
draw out in terms of the mental structures that might be there. We've talked a fair bit about rhythm. I wonder if we could just flesh out a bit what the current best guess model is for human cognition between the rhythmic cognition and the melodic. Ooh. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting... Uh, I, well, it's a good question. My hunch is that there might be some big changes in our thinking in the coming years. <laughs> uh, uh, this is because a paper that, that I also described briefly in, in the Evolving Animal Orchestra. Um, for instance, if you look at birds, I will come back to, on humans in a moment, but if you look at birds, it turns out that birds, when they listen to music, they do not particularly pay attention, or primarily, not, not primarily at least, uh, attention to pitch and rhythm, but more to spectral change. So it's, it turns out that birds actually listen to music, if you put them in such a situation, uh, in the way we listen to speech. If we listen to speech, we listen to the, 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 the spectral changes all the time, because that's the vowels, that's where the information is. We don't pay so much attention to yeah, the pitches that we speak or the rhythm that we speak, that's, that's secondary, that is additional information. And for some strange reason, if you compare it to birds, <laughs> we humans, Listen, if we listen to music, we hear melody and rhythm. Um, if you play the same melody on a, in the guitar or on a violin, it sounds just like the same melody. If you do that to a bird, it's a completely different thing because the spectral is, spectrum is different. And I find that a fascinating difference that, that sort of uh, hints that it might be, or I, I, my intuition says that this sort of being uh, more get more information out of the spectrum itself is more fundamental. It's something we share with more animals in that sense. In that sense, fundamental, and that this idea of focusing on melody and 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 and, and rhythm is maybe something that we is more culturally. It's yeah. Stephen Pinker, he's not very uh, uh, he's a uh, evolutionary psychologist. He he said that music is actually a supernormal stimulus. Uh, music is something that super normally st stimulates uh, our senses that are developed for something else. And he might be partially right, I think. I, I, he's, he, he bashed uh, music as an as auditory cheesecake a, uh, a long time ago. Uh, but this idea that, 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 that melody and rhythm are actually uh, super normally stimulated aspects of music might be might be uh, yeah a proper at least it's one way of looking at at how music uh, works so that's where i would say the next step would be not so much like is it melody or the components of melody is it relative pitch contour perception uh, absolute pitch or in rhythm is it beat perception meter interval perception all these components that you can think of but maybe a more common uh, sensitivity to relative uh, proportions or relations yeah that's really interesting and that there was a slightly related chapter in the origins book about auditory scene analysis and how we can compare how our brain you know interprets different sound sources in our environment with how we tune into different components of music and i think it was making a, a slightly similar distinction of what you're listening spectrally or in these rhythmic and melodic terms it's um yeah. That's a great it's, it's chapter a, by Laurel Trainer. Yeah, it's a bit hard to wrap your brain around, really. I think when you're coming from that almost abstract music theory perspective of here is a note on the page and it has pitch and duration, to yeah. leap across to that kind of Fourier spectrum world of much richer data but much more complex too, and I think um, it's going to be fascinating to see if there is an yeah. intersection there that can reveal more about how we distill out into melody and rhythm from what we hear. So one of the the aspects of the origins book that was that I knew would be of most interest to our audience was to look at how things differ from individual to individual. And before we address that question head on, you had this fantastic TEDx talk in which you made a comment along the lines of everyone thinks absolute pitch is an incredible magical talent, but actually it's relative pitch, which is more special. I wonder if you could explain that a little bit, distinguish between the two and why you think we should be a bit prouder of the fact that we have good relative pitch. Yeah, uh, yeah absolute pitch is a nice one because it's, 
if in a lecture I ask the audience, what is now, what, what do you consider a very special musical listening skill? Everybody immediately, perfect pitch, absolute pitch. <laughs> uh, because it, 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 it's, uh, yeah, it looks like a miracle. Eh? You play a key on the, on the piano and you say, well, F sharp, uh, correct. <laughs> and it seems to be one in 20,000 people have that. Uh, it has a clear biological basis. We can we know in the genome where uh, where it is uh, largely coded. So 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 that's obviously a, uh, a biological talent. But it and it but it is it's also good to realize it's a talent we share with lots of mammals. Lots of dogs have absolute pitch. Uh, wolves we know macaques other uh, other mammals. Uh, also songbirds they tend to, if they're forced to, they tend to remember a melody of its absolute pitch. So a melody slightly higher is another melody for a bird. It's another bird, <laughs> basically. Uh, so, um, but we think it is a very musical talent, and I think that's incorrect. Uh, but still, but still, um, uh, it seems that absolute pitch is actually far more widespread than we think. This, this, this is a strange task. Okay? So absolute pitch is a strange term because you say, well, you hear a tone. Uh, you have to classify it as a certain pitch, whether this was on the piano or whether somebody sung the tone. And then you have to say, you have to label it with a note label, like C sharp, F, F, uh, F G, whatever. Um, so there, it's actually a more cognitive skill. But the first part of that, sort of re recognizing or remembering uh, a certain pitch, is something we can do very well. And children can do it even better. So you have this wonderful test where you present children the famous tunes from television, and you scale some of these tunes, uh, a semitone up or down, they recognize the original. Also, I do it sometimes with, I, I think I do it in the TED talk. I, 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 I show a fragment of the, B, the Bee Gees singing Stay In Alive without sound, and then I ask somebody to sing it. I've done it now multiple times. If you ask somebody to sort of re relax a bit, because they have to relax, and then sing how you thought staying alive would sound like they sing it almost 80% of the time, spot on on the right pitch, starting with a C, <laughs> and in the right tempo, 130 beats per minute. So we have a very good memory for songs that we know very well uh, and have repetitively heard, and we can remember that. It's a skill we also have. So if you know staying alive of the Bee Gees, you know that that starts with a C. So you can sort of, yeah, that's absolute pitch. But it is not special in the sense that we share it with lots of animals. It's also not special in the sense that it doesn't really contribute to our musical appreciation. So it, I think it is a, yeah, that has not so much to do with music, I would say. And relative pitch, so sort of recognizing a melody independent of its pitch height. If I sing a happy birthday, high or low, or fast or slow, you recognize it, oh, that's happy birthday. That's special. <laughs> Because lots of things change all the time. The frequency ratios, the frequency the cells, the timing, everything changes. Say it's the same thing. And that's something, it's, uh, birds cannot do that. Uh, and that's something we find trivial. And that's actually yeah, a key ingredient of the pleasure of listening to music, that we can make these relationships all the time. So indeed, relative pitch is, is key in musicality. We all agree about that in the, in the field at the moment. An absolute pitch is, uh, is something awkward that has not so much to do with musicality. I, I have to be careful how I phrase it, depending on who I'm talking to, but we sometimes talk about how it's, it's almost a gimmick or a party trick that actually doesn't help you all that much in your musical life. And, you know, we say that to reassure those who feel like they'll never be able to transcribe music because they don't have absolute pitch or that kind of thing. And I love the way you explained it just now. It also seems like another beautiful example of how the research can shed light on what's going on under the hood in the sense that if we have that auditory memory with absolute pitch, mm -hmm. but we can't put a label on it, well, we've kind of got half the skill there. You know, it's not yeah. as simple as can you do it or not. An important half, uh, maybe it's more than half, it's, it, that's the skill. And then the labeling is just uh, assigning a label to a category. You can do that also in other ways, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about where the field might be going. I wonder if we could wrap up just by talking mm -hmm. about what you're most excited about researching next and what the most interesting, outstanding questions are in the field. <laughs> Oof, yeah. Uh, 
in 30 um, words or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm interested in, in a, uh, one line of research is to continue this comparative work. So I'm, I'm continuing to do this, especially now uh, with, uh, with birds, zebra finches instead of monkeys. So that's one line of research. Another big project I'm, I'm actually writing on research proposals at the moment uh, for a few years is to really make the biological link uh, so, uh, uh, concrete on the genetic level. So we're now working on a, on a large international consortium because this is research that you have to do with hundreds of people, uh, trying to get a, a group together that is effective enough to say, what is the genetic basis for music? Uh, we know that for absolute pitch, we know that for some rhythmic and pitch aspects. And uh, yeah, the ambition to, to really underpin the biological basis in, a, in its genetic sense uh, in the genome. Uh, that will take a long time, but it is a wonderful tool. It's a complicated tool, but a wonderful tool because it can again answer questions that have been around for such a long time. Like, uh, for instance, if you if you know where in the genome or probably in multiple locations particular sensitivities, musical sensitivities are are coded, like for instance beat perception, you can look at at the genome of other species, but also of distinct species like uh, the Neanderthals or Homo erectus, and then. You have this wonderful tool to say something about the history of music that we can't do now. Music doesn't fossilize. Huh? I mean, we find one flute of 45,000 years ago and that's it. Uh, our musical brain also doesn't fossilize. So we have no comparison. And then with genetics, if we get that in our fingers, that will take a while, uh, at least five years, then we suddenly have a tool in, in, in getting into this history of how music and when music rose and why. And uh, yeah, and that's something that I find very exciting. And I try to convince, uh, uh, yeah, especially Europe right, in this case, to, to give enough money <laughs> to realize that. Yeah. Tremendous. Well, as I was saying to you, I've so enjoyed reading your two most recent books, and I wholeheartedly recommend them. I think it's fair to say Origins of Musicality is a fairly fairly serious academic book for those who really want the detailed research and origin uh, sorry the evolving animal orchestra is a, a lighter read because you tell you share the research in a very storytelling way but both uh, thoroughly fascinating we've barely scratched the surface in this conversation but i do have to be respectful of your time today so i just want to say a huge thank you and if you could leave people with a place to go if they want to learn more and pick up a copy of those books yeah, uh, I think if you Google on the titles, you will find you find information uh, uh, easily. But uh, I, I think a good start is musiccognition.nl and otherwise mgg.uva.nl. That's our research group in, uh, in Amsterdam. I hope to see you there. <laughs> we'll certainly have links to those in the show notes for this episode at musicalitynow.com. And just a huge thank you again, Professor Honing. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me, yeah. Oh, hey, one more thing. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube. And if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's gonna help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out. And it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.